Dear colleagues, I would like to greet you all at our seminar series organized by Armenian Eye Care Project Foundation and Malian Ophthalmology Center. I think that this novel educational initiative will be beneficial for our annually organized international conferences and other educational opportunities. We are planning to hold recurrent seminars and mostly once per month and we will focus on a narrow specialty during each one of them. Our seminar today is devoted to cornea diseases, which will be discussed with our Armenian and American colleagues. The seminar will be chaired by Anna Vakimian with her colleagues from Armenia. Let me introduce Anna Vakimian, Doctor of Medical Sciences, Professor, Associate Professor of Eye Diseases at the Yerevan State Medical University, also Professor, Head of the Inflammatory Eye Diseases Department at Malaya Center of Ophthalmology, and of course Armenian Ophthalmology Program Fellow. Here are our colleagues from the U.S. Matthew Wade, Associate Clinical Professor of Ophthalmology at the University of California, Irvine, Gavin Herbert Eye Institute, Head of Cornea Department and Ophthalmologist. Also, Olivia Lin, Associate Clinical Professor in Ophthalmology at the University of California, Irvine, Anterior Segment Imaging Laboratory Director. I'm sure that the presented interesting clinical cases as well as case discussions, uh, those will be useful for our wide audience. You can refer your questions in Zoom Q&A section. And now I would like to pass the chair to Anova Kimian and she will be the seminar chair today. Thank you. I think that I will continue in Armenian as well. I would like to greet you all, all our colleagues from Armenia and from the US. Thank you very much, dear Armenian Eye Care Project, for this great uh, project and for launching it. And this will give an opportunity to develop our knowledge even more. And in the end of discussions, always new ideas are born. And let me today uh, devote the seminar to the corneal infectious diseases. We decided that uh, we will discuss two interesting clinical cases. One of them would be infectious crystalline keratopathy, which is a kind of infectious keratitis and herpetic stromal necrotizing keratitis. And these presentations will be presented by rotat rotating residents in our departments, Arpine Grigorian and Mariam Ghazarian. And I would like to add that a similar presentation will be presented by Dr. Olivia Lin. Dr. Olivia Lin, yes, she will also be presenting today and we will have discussions afterwards. I think we can proceed. I would like to pass the speech to Armenia Gregorian, third year resident. And we decided that they will be presenting in English uh, with inter simultaneous interpretation uh, because we would like to respect also our colleagues from abroad. Please, Arpine, the floor is yours. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm Arpine. Uh, first of all, I want to thank Armenian Eye Care Project for the given opportunity to start our ACP Grand Rounds program. Um, now I am resident at Malan Eye Center and at uh, Cornea Uveitis Department. And today I would like to talk about infectious crystalline keratopathy. Mm, just shortly, infectious crystalline keratopathy is a type of infection keratitis with characteristic needle-like crystalline-like branching opacities uh, within the corneal stroma with almost no host inflammatory response. It presents as chronic colonization of microorganisms uh, shielded by a biofilm. Risk factors for ICK uh, include previous corneal surgery, long-term uh, topical steroid treatment, prior corneal diseases, and uh, systemic conditions uh, that already uh, associated with immunosuppression. Uh, 
Uh, ICK uh, most commonly is found in patients uh, who have undergone penetrating keratoplasty. Uh, other surgeries and conditions uh, that have been reported are listed on the screen. Mm -hmm. uh, most common organisms uh, associated with ICK is a group of alpha hemolytic streptococcus viridans. Other causative organisms include uh, pneumococcus, uh, a typical mycobacterium species, candida species, etc. Uh, differential diagnosis of ICK uh, includes uh, infectious keratitis like fungal, bacterial, herpetic uh, that can rarely present with uh, crystalline-like deposits or non-infectious crystalline keratopathies uh, such as Schneider crystalline uh, dystrophy, lipid keratopathy, multiple myeloma, and graft rejection. Um, cases of ICK may be asymptomatic or present with uh, usual symptoms uh, of keratitis, uh, but here conjunctival injections and adjacent inflammation are less severe compared with typical microbial uh, keratitis. Most important part here uh, that the deposits have crystalline-like uh, appearance. Yeah, management of uh, ICK requires uh, corneal scraping for cultures and smears. It is useful uh, for selection of appropriate treatment. Uh, but as far as epithelium is almost always intact, uh, doctors uh, just go with empirical treatment. Uh, so first line uh, treatment uh, of ICK is topical broad spectrum antimicrobial therapy, then targeted to microorganism sensitivity. Uh, and of course, uh, reduction of steroid drops as much as possible. Uh, adjunctive therapy uh, includes disruption of microorganisms, biofilm by a laser, uh, by intrastromal injections, keratectomy, uh, and, uh, but if the disease does not respond to treatment, surgical intervention may be required in order to eradicate uh, the infection or to treat scar formation uh, that can cause decreased visual acuity. Um, so um, today I would like to uh, show some cases from our practice. Uh, this was uh, 30, uh, this was uh, 83 year old female uh, with history of uh, penetrating keratoplasty. Uh, after eight months, uh, she was, uh, she presented with um, branching crystalline like lesions. Uh, so she was on topical steroids twice a day uh, and steroids were stopped and was placed on topical moxifloxacin every hour. Uh, and as you can see, stromal infiltrate got cleared within uh, eight months. The next case, uh, so... <clears throat> The 50-year-old male history of PK surgery, three months later presented with white grayish opacities. Uh, so this was uh, the only one in our case series that ICK uh, developed after three months of surgery. So at that time, he was on steroids uh, four times a day and steroids was... Uh, were stopped and uh, he was started on topical moxifloxacin and the uh, disease responded to treatment in uh, eight months. And um, two months later, Dr. Havakimian uh, performed FECO and next day he got 20-20 uncorrected. Um, so uh, uh, this was a 73 year old male monocular patient with history of penetrating trauma and multiple surgeries like vitrectomy, trabeculectomy, iridoplasty, PKP, um, secondary IL implantation. Um, eight months after PKP presented uh, with crystalline-like lesions on the graft, 
and uh, it was started on topical moxie uh, every hour and fortified vancomycin and steroids were stopped and the lesion resolved in nine months and as you can see on the right pictures uh, he was left with uh, mild scar formation uh, this is 56 year old female uh, with history of PKP. Uh, seven months uh, uh, later, presented with uh, crystalline like lesions. Uh, she was started on topical moxie and steroids were stopped, um, but ICK didn't respond to medical treatment even in 14 months. Uh, so uh, we have done corneal scrapings uh, and for cultures and smears and cultures and smears revealed uh, gram positive cocci but the lab specialist was not sure what type of cocci it was um, and the culture is still pending and uh, both Dr. Habakimian and patient uh, decided to go for a surgery uh, so on the right picture you can see uh, repeat PK. Uh, it was done um, three days ago on Tuesday. Uh, now I'll show some uh, typical uh, and interesting cases from Dr. Havakimian's medical atlas. Uh, so um, this was a patient uh, where ICK were performed. Uh, ICK uh, Develop. Was developed uh, developed after pterygium excision. Uh, so, to our knowledge, this was uh, the first report that the ICK uh, developed after pterygium uh, excision, caused by Mycobacterium, Mycobacterium chelonii. And uh, recently, Dr. Uh, Aldave and uh, colleagues uh, reported similar case. Uh, similar case that um, ICK was secondary to Mycobacterium chelonii. In their cases, it was due to PK, after yeah, PK. Um, okay. Um, so, although uh, Corinobacterium uh, has never been reported to cause ICK, uh, but uh, we had a case uh, very similar to ICK, it is also included in Dr. Harakimian's medical atlas. Initially, it uh, appeared like crystalline looking uh, like lesions associated with overlying epithelial defect. And culture confirmed uh, corinobacterium and uh, it responded to antibiotic treatment uh, during three months. Uh, and the last case uh, that was kind of mimicking ICK, some places here you can see uh, fine crystalline looking like lesions. Uh, the scraping came uh, positive for candida and uh, based on sensitivity report, uh, the patient uh, responded very well to antifungal therapy. Um, and uh, this picture uh, was taken after two months. Uh, as you can see uh, here, only left subepithelial scarring. And at the end, uh, uh, we prepared some questions for our uh, US colleagues. Uh, so I would like to ask how common is uh, this condition in your practice? Because uh, in our practice, uh, in our department, uh, uh, cornea department performs uh, 120 uh, to 150 corneal surgeries per year, and a department faces at least two cases per year. Um, the second question, how long do you keep patients on immunosuppression after PK, and do you generally perform scraping and cultures? Uh, thank you. I think that this is a rare condition. Uh, I think I probably have seen less cases than you if you're telling us that you see two cases per year. Um, I think my whole life I've only seen a handful of cases. Um, and this is including cases referred to us from the outside. Um, but like you say, most commonly after PKP, um, 
actually, we recently, not so recently, maybe one year ago, we had two cases very similar in time of um, infectious crystalline keratopathy after corneal crosslinking that we are getting ready to report. Um, and uh, like you said, we stopped the topical steroids. However, we actually found in these two cases that stopping the corticosteroid made the patient worse, even though we are also treating with uh, antimicrobial therapy, of course, um, actually by abruptly stopping the steroid, the patient even developed um, hypopion and anterior chamber cell. So we actually had to increase the topical steroid to make the crystals go away. And unfortunately in these two patients, the crystals were in the visual axis. So they were very visually significant. Uh, after we treated the infectious component, then the crystals kind of co coalesced, but it wasn't until we added back the topical steroid that the scar formation reduced to the point where the patient could get the vision back. But both patients ended up with pretty good visual result afterwards. And they had both had bilateral cross-linking, but only each patient only had the infectious crystalline keratopathy in one eye. And it both Very occurred after they stopped the steroid. Very interesting because our cases, as you've seen um, already, as you saw already, they usually started after seven months, eight months. We had only one case that was that early, three months later. Mm -hmm. I wonder if you have seen a case that early after PK, three months later, or, um, you know, in I other cases. <laughs> I can't it remember. was kind of too early. So mm -hmm. do you get that much immunosuppression in three months that showed up? Uh, I don't know, that it developed. But in other cases that we discontinued steroids, they, they were already like twice a day because mm -hmm. it was seven months, eight months, and we just don't stop it immediately. Like kind of a week for once a day and then maybe every other day and stop it. But all our cases responded like for eight or nine months under topical antibiotic. It took very long, but all cases responded. They ended up with mm -hmm. subacute scarring. And the only case that did not was the lady with 14 months history. So that I did PK three days ago. Um, both patient and me were just very unhappy dealing with it more than a year. <laughs> so this is interesting. And what about the scraping? Do you, do all, do you always do scraping? If the epithelium is intact, do you still scrape it and uh, do cultures and smears? Yes. I think it is hard to convince the patient to do the scraping uh -huh. <laughs> because they, uh, they're going to have some pain from that. But yes, right. I think you have to because um, although the number one um, bacteria would be um, strep viridins, as you say, there are other causes. And like you pointed out, you had a few right. cases of other organisms. So how would right. you know that unless you at least attempt to scrape yes. it? Um, I also think when you scrape it, you will find that some of that crystalline material can come off with your scraping. Right. So it can be somewhat therapeutic as well. So yes, I always scrape. And I think I think if you only have this disease happen very rarely, I wouldn't change how you're applying the topical steroid because you're just going to trade um, immunologic rejection episodes for, right. for this, right? I do agree. Just when looking to the literature, it says like it's one out of thousand cases and we are two cases out of hundred. I thought we are seeing it more than others, but... Maybe, maybe, I, I, maybe that's true because as I said, I have not seen as many cases as you have. Um, I, I also I think, was thinking uh -huh. that the crystals may not necessarily represent that the infectious organism is still present. Um, because also, mm -hmm. I will show you a little bit later, we have a confocal microscope. So I do confocal microscopy on many of our infectious cases. And um, the two cases, maybe I can share my screen and show you. Um, so we often do confocal microscopy for routinely for infectious keratitis cases. And um, in these two cases, so this this is one case that um, after coronal cross-linking, and you can see after treatment, it is improved. But what I want to show you is the confocal microscopy shows the crystals um, in the coronal stroma. You can see these crystalline structures. Um, and that's a nice correlation with your with the clinical exam that shows the crystals. However, I just want to point out that I 
this is not the only time I see these crystals when I do confocal microscopy. So I actually think these uh, microscopic structures that you see here, these hyper-reflective, very geometric uh, linear structures can be seen in other conditions. I think it's an uh, inflammatory sign. I don't necessarily think that just because you see a crystal in the cornea, it necessarily means that the organism is still present. So I wonder if your case of uh, the 14 month uh, recalcitrant case, maybe you already killed the organism and you just have some crystals that you can see at the slit lamp. Just the appearance didn't change in 14 months. <laughs> <That all>? is... <laughs> <laughs> so maybe also could be uh, an organism you were not expecting. Maybe, maybe maybe fungal organism, but you're treating it as um, bacterial or something like that. Maybe, maybe the lab person was not very sure. Just she said it looks like cocci on the glass. We do not mm -hmm. have confocal microscope, unfortunately. Um, so the cultures are still pending. But as far as we decided to go for PK, so <laughs> we just mm -hmm. <laughs> finished with that. Thank you so much for sharing sure. your cases. Mm -hmm. And maybe we'll go just with your presentation. Dr. Olivia Lee, Pearls for Infectious Keratitis Management. Would you please uh, start your presentation? So um, my name is Olivia Lee, and then our fellow, Wendy Huang, she's also going to join us. So we're going to present this together. So I put together um, 10 quick, per well, may not be so quick, but 10 pearls um, to help you with successful management of infectious keratitis. So um, go ahead, Wendy. So I'm going to start out with the first four pearls. Um, pearl number one, culturing the cornea is rarely a bad idea. So um, doing corneal culture is, especially before treatment, is really key to kind of identifying organisms. Um, unfortunately, a lot of times when you get referred patients, a lot of times they already are on antibiotics. So it is difficult to get uh, good culture results, but it's still worthwhile. So scraping culture, any ulcer that's greater than two millimeters in diameter or something smaller, it's, it's more difficult to get enough to, to actually get something to grow out in culture. Um, we often use either a 15 blade, a Camara spatula, um, a Calgi swab, or even a cotton swab is, is um, a, a good way to, to culture. These are some images of us culturing using a Calgi swab. And, um, and then what you wanna do to culture effectively is you wanna clear the mucoid material first and really get to the base of the ulcer. Of course, you don't wanna scrape when the cornea is very thin and or lose any more corneal tissue. So you don't wanna take too much corneal tissue away, but if there's a lot of mucus, you wanna clear it. And then another alternative to scraping, if the infiltrate is very deep, uh, you can use a braided suture and just pass through the infiltrate so you don't risk losing any tissue. And um, that'll actually drag some organism along the way and you, you place that um, suture material to actually culture. And then culture the cornea before starting therapy, if possible, as I mentioned, reculture the cornea, though, if, the, uh, if it's not responding to the therapy as expected. So it's no downside to reculture. Um, the purpose of doing these cultures is really to identify the causal organisms, determine drug sensitivity, which is key for effective treatment, and removing ineffective treatment that might be causing some other issues, and then um, predictive outcomes for these patients, kind of knowing what their prognosis is, and then um, identifying secular trends. So what organisms are in the community, um, and then emerging resistance within the community. And then um, negative cultures are more likely. Um, and then there's also usually a significant delay in recovering the pathogen. So we've all experienced it where we've cultured, but you're already on the way to treatment, things have already improved and then you get the result or things have not improved and you get the result. Um, change in appearance and ocular surface from treatment. Um, sometimes uh, white deposits from things like ciprofloxacin or bezavance. Um, or uh, fortified antibiotics or pred forte can cause uh, a, diff a change in appearance. Um, and then um, epithelial keratopathy from fortified antibiotics or um, things like veroptic can cause a change in appearance. So it's really important to kind of uh, track how things are going closely. 
Uh, pearl number three, if, is a, if a patient already has a started antimicrobial therapy, but there is a contact lens case um, and it's contact lens related, um, it, it, you can maybe get the organism from the contact lens case. So culture what you can. Um, and then know how to send your corneal scrapings to get the most effective culture results for microbiology. So these are just kind of the, you know, the things that we use for culture. I'm sure it's, it's pretty standard. Um, and then these are the different medias to know exactly which organisms will grow and what. And then the different stains that we use. So we always use this in our kit for our corneal cultures. We do this set for maybe not the acanthamoeba, but we do everything else that's pictured here for every single patient. But if we are thinking of some specific organism, for example, if we're thinking about acanthamoeba, then we have to add um, another, uh, another swab. And then we just, the point we want to make here is that if you're thinking of some very specific thing, if we want to think about acanthamoeba, for example, then um, the lab will need to put the specimen on this non-nutrient auger with E. coli overlay. And our clinic, we don't keep that media. So we just need to know that we need to send an extra specimen and an extra slide if we want some special testing. And then PCR. Um, this has been very helpful for us in a lot of cases. Um, very sensitive. The good thing about it is you, you need a small volume only, so you can get a um, really good yield in terms of, um, e even when you get just a little bit of uh, uh, tissue to culture. So um, basically you can really do PCR for anything. Uh, there's viral PCR, um, acanthamoeba, mycobacteria, chlamydia, toxoplasmosis. So this is just an example of the form that we have that we use for send out. And a lot of times we've had culture negative ulcers and then PCR positive. So pearl number five is that if the culture is unexpectedly negative, think about alternative methods of diagnosis. So here I want to talk to you about corneal biopsy and then confocal microscopy. So uh, let's say you are treating this infectious um, keratitis, it's not getting better, you've already cultured it, the cultures are negative, but you know that it is infectious. And the patient um, is on empiric therapy and not getting better as you expect. So you really, really need to know what the organism is. And before you go to full thickness penetrating keratoplasty, you can take um, a biopsy so that you can send that for culture and to um, for histopathology. So the way we do this culture, you can see it's nice and round, is we use a dermatologic punch and they come in very small diameters, like two millimeters, three millimeters. And you just do a partial thickness trephination. Um, of course, don't enter the eye. Uh, and you just take that small piece and then we bisect the piece, send half for microbiology and half to histopathology. Um, and that can be very helpful. You can also remember the um, suture pass technique that Wendy described. And I know you don't have confocal microscopy, but because uh, this is a topic of my interest, I will show you some images from our confocal. We get referred a lot of patients uh, for rule out acanthamoeba keratitis, because as you know, this organism does not grow easily in culture. We've had much better luck with PCR, but even the PCR would take at least a week to come back. But the confocal microscopy, because we have it in the office, we can do it the same day and we can, it, can get an instantaneous answer. Most people would use the confocal microscope to just tell you yes or no. You have acanthamoeba or we don't see it. Um, but for me, I feel like this confocal microscope can be more powerful than that. We can also tell you the density of the cysts that we find and the location. So we could tell you how close it's getting to the limbus. We could tell you the depth in the stroma. So it's a case where it has not penetrated into the stroma, but it's just in the epithelium, it has a better prognosis than if I tell you, oh, we see cysts all the way down to 500 microns. We can also see uh, fungal keratitis. Here you see these beautiful branching hyphae. Um, and again, 
fungus doesn't grow as easily in culture. And even if you did have a positive culture, you're not going to get it the same day. But we can do this on the same day and give you and see the organism. And that way, we don't waste any time by treating the patient with antibiotic therapy when they needed antifungal therapy. Uh, these are spores. Um, these are a little bit harder to identify because I'll show you in the next slide that in bacterial keratitis, we see a lot of leukocytes. So I will admit to you that this picture and this picture can be difficult to differentiate and we do use um, clinical correlation to help us. So with bacterial keratitis, we will not see the organism. The organism is much too small for us to visualize with comfortable microscopy. But what we can see is this pattern of abundant leukocyte infiltrates. And that's um, these oval-shaped hyperreflective round or round um, structures in the corneal stroma. And although this can be seen in other conditions too, but if we are looking at a case of infectious keratitis and we're thinking, could this be bacterial? Could this be acanthamoeba? This is a helpful sign. For viral keratitis, again, we will not see the organism. It is much too small to see on confocal, but a nice helpful sign is the reduction or absence of the corneal nerves. So here I'm showing you the layer of the cornea, which should have many corneal nerves, and we don't see any. So that's also a nice clue. I published this in 2019, these, the images that I just showed you, and our sensitivity and specificity of diagnosing infectious keratitis using confocal alone. So, I mean, the sensitivity de depends and also depends on the person reading it. So we've looked at a lot of these cases over years, and we also will image patients that we know what the organism is to help us um, build our database and learn from that. So it, I think it also depends on um, how severe the keratitis is at the time when you are doing it. If you send the patient when the entire cornea is completely opaque, then we can't get as nice of an image. So I like to do the confocal microscopy the day that the patient presents if possible. So pearl number six is know what organisms are common in your patient demographic and your geographic region. Because I could tell you what is common in our area, but you're, you're a whole world away from us. And um, I think there are changes that even within the United States, depending on the climate, um, you'll get different organisms. But some simple things to think about is contact lens use uh, predisposes you to pseudomonas, but also acanthamoeba. Uh, water exposure, ex especially uh, tap water, patients that use tap water to clean their uh, contact lenses are at risk for acanthamoeba. We've lately been getting a lot of very young people who wear ortho-K that um, were not wearing their um, ortho-K lenses responsibly, um, washing them with tap water or handling them with tap water or swimming in contact lenses. Chronic topical steroid use, you can think of fungal keratitis. And if the patient has a history of uh, oral ulcers, we think of herpetic disease. Um, so this is within our geographic region, what is most common. So bacterial ulcers, far and away the most common. And within bacterial, these are the common and uncommon organisms. But in our region, um, staph and strep, most common, and then less so pseudomonas. Um, but again, I wouldn't go just by this because this depends on your area and certain trends in the community, but also um, think about what risk factors the individual patient has. So we will present to you in a few minutes, a patient who has exposure to plant material, and that should make you think fungal keratitis. So uh, Wendy, you're gonna do the section, right? Um, so Taylor, therapy- Can I jump in for just a to... second? Yes, please, oh, go Wendy, ahead. Sorry. So I'm just curious uh, to our Armenian colleagues, what, can you go back on your slide to what, what's mm -hmm. most common here? I'm curious to know if there's something different in what you see. Do you see certain organisms that are more common there than here? I would say the most common infectious type, infectious keratitis type here is herpetic. Herpes is really very common in Armenia. Um, I don't know why. <laughs> uh, maybe some social conditions, some habits in our, uh, you know, 
people to hug or kiss each other all the time, <laughs> transferring the virus through the uh, you know, skin and uh, mucosa. But regarding the bacteria, it's pretty much the same. We mainly see stuff that's trapped and maybe pneumococcus again, a less common pseudomonas, uh, very rare moraxella. Uh, it's pretty much the same. We don't see many fungus, but I do see at least five or six cases per year. Uh, people who work in the villages who are exposed to soil and um, it looks like very much similar to the one you are presenting now. Thank now you. I think even, even in the United States here on the West Coast, I think we see more Canada than on the East Coast. Do you think so, Matt? <laughs> I guess we. Oh, no, I don't, I've heard. I've heard that. They, yeah, definitely regional differences, but I, I haven't experienced that myself. So, uh, fungal keratitis treatment. We'll go in a little bit into that. Um, so, uh, first, natamycin, according to the MUT trial, it's superior to voriconazole. So we put that. We start that empirically first. It's for filamentous fungi, and then um, amphotericin is mainly for yeast. So, kind of knowing which agent targets what is important. And then you can do intrastromal or intracranial injections of voriconazole or amphotericin. And then addition of oral agents, um, we found that voriconazole actually has better uh, ocular penetration. Um, you could do ketoconazole, fluconazole, and posaconazole is actually a, a newer um, agent for recalcitrant, more resistant cases. We are seeing some cases of pen resistance. So posaconazole is a, a a newer drug that's been helpful. So I just wanted to, this is a good uh, case. Um, it, I guess so, um, this is a patient who presented to us with an ulcer, very advanced ulcer, as you can see, and initially was started on um, antibacterial fortified. So fortified tobermycin, vancomycin, and then vegamox as well. And um, didn't really improve very much and had kind of an infiltrate that was very suggestive of, um, of fungus, just kind of by appearance and also by history. So he's a gardener. So the history is really kind of what tips you off more towards fungus. So um, we, we started him on an um, antifungals pretty quickly, uh, voriconazole and natamycin and ended up doing um, a PKP um, soon into treatment just because there was um, pretty good advancement of the disease. And even despite PKP, we're finding recurrence in the graft. Um, after culturing and reculturing and eventually sending to PCR, it, we found that this patient actually grew out a pan-resistant fusarium. So he was started on a, um, a new drug um, that, that is targeted and is, is basically the only medication that this organism is sensitive to. And since then he has gotten a PK. Um, and during the time of the second transplant, we actually found that there was invasion of the ciliary body and a fungal endoplomitis. So the fungus had actually penetrated deep and had started to get some internal structures. A lot of the iris and parts of the ciliary body had to be excised at the time of surgery. And, um, and of course, um, our retina colleagues were involved. Uh, we were able to do the transplant and um, with the help of the new agent, actually the patient is cleared of infection now, which is great and can tolerate topical steroids to help with the transplant. So really targeting um, the treatment to the organism is what really saved this patient's eye. Yeah, we were very lucky. Our infectious disease colleagues helped us in this case because we didn't know what to do. We said we, we only have so many topical uh, ophthalmic agents to target um, uh, fungal keratitis, and this organism is resistant to all of them. What should we do? And they had an experimental uh, systemic oral drug that they um, enrolled the patient in the clinical trial, and it was amazing. It just, the patient, we should have put a picture of what he looks like now. He just looks beautiful. Um, so that's really the, the new drug that saved us. So pearl number eight is to know when to use cortical steroids and know when to avoid them. So I think for viral keratitis, it is well accepted that you use topical steroid in non-necrotizing stromal keratitis, um, especially with you know dense 
stromal infiltrate, but then to be more cautious with necrotizing cases, especially with large epithelial involvement. Um, so for example, I can show you some of these types of cases would be very um, typical that you would use them, especially you see a case of endotheliitis, they have um, anterior chamber reaction as well. Here is uh, interstitial stromal keratitis, but then with these necrotizing cases, especially with the cornea melting and a large epithelial defect, be more um, cautious to use the topical steroid. But of course, um, you're not going to use the topical steroid alone in these types of cases. You would also be using them in conjunction with systemic antivirals. And one mistake I often see is patients or maybe the physician gets confused about the correct dose um, between for HSV and VZV and the active dose and the maintenance dose, I feel like people get kind of confused. And uh, one mistake that I have seen is that the patient uh, will be taking a much lower dose than you prescribe because they'll say that the pill is too large, they don't want to swallow it, and that couldn't by itself explain why they're not getting better. The topical steroid will, of course, help, but they will have recurrences if they're not taking the correct dosage. Um, how about in other situations? So we know that topical corticosteroids predisposes to keratitis, uh, especially in patients wearing contact lenses. So that is a definite no-no in my book. Um, but there's cases where you have to use corticosteroids in like you were talking about in your cases. After PKP, we, al we always use topical steroid. Um, so I would say the exception to that is in fungal keratitis, and I'll talk about that in a little bit later. But how about topical corticosteroids for bacterial ulcers? I think in the past, there used to be this debate about the people who are very pro-steroid, thinking that it would help for faster epithelialization and reduce the patient's immune response to the dying organism and help save the uh, native cornea from tissue destruction. And on the other hand, there were patient, people who are very against topical steroids thinking that you're opening the door to the organism um, growing faster. So it's nice now that we have the results of the SCUT trial to go off of. So in my practice, this is what I do. I, I follow the SCUT trial very um, strictly. So in that, in that trial, any proven bacterial ulcer that is improving on topical antimicrobials for 48 hours, they added QID prednisolone. And that resulted in about one line of improvement in the visual outcome. So that is typically what I do. If I feel like this patient is non-compliant and may not come back, then I'm a little bit more cautious. And sometimes I'll use twice a day topical steroid, have the patient come back in a day or two before I increase to four times a day. But I do try to otherwise follow the SCUT trial. Um, I am worried about patients using the topical steroid, feeling much better, and then using the topical steroid at a higher dose than you intend, and then never coming back. That does worry me. So that's why in some cases I am a little bit more cautious, but I definitely ask the patient to come back very soon after starting the topical steroids. Pearl number nine is that you can use corneal glue to temporize very small corneal perforated ulcerations. Um, and we do this routinely in our practice. We have uh, the corneal glue available. Um, for any kind of perforation that is small. If it is very tiny micro perforation, um, we might just uh, apply either a small amount of glue, or if we think it's very, very small, we might just give a topical timolol to reduce aqueous production, to reduce the amount of flow of aqueous through the micro perforation. But generally we'll put a small dab of glue if the uh, corneal ulcer is the perforation or near perforated area is very small, like less than two millimeters in diameter. But if it's larger than two millimeters in diameter or there is extrusion of intraocular contents, so the lower photograph, um, there was, I don't know if you can see, but there's vitreous coming out of the corneal perforation going to the upper lid. Um, and so in that case, it's not appropriate to glue that patient. So if the corneal perforation is too large or inappropriate to glue, and it is peripheral, then we do a patch graft, but if it's central, we'll take the patient for a tectonic penetrating keratoplasty. 
So the patch graft can be done for either near perforation or full thickness perforation, but I would only do it if it's peripheral. And in fact, in this photograph, I think probably this was even too more central than I wanted because you now see that the, there are sutures in the visual axis. Um, there are many methods to doing the glue and there are various glues that are available. Um, currently in our practice, we use Dermabond. It's easy to get um, commercially available. Um, the only bad thing about it is that once you break the seal, it, st it starts to come out from the front. And then if you want to, if you feel like, oh, I need some more glue in five minutes, it's dried up, you need to open a new one versus the ones that are in the um, packaging, like shown on the uh, upper picture, you can cut that micro pipette. You can seal it again when you're done to save the rest of the glue to use the next time. Um, but there's a right and wrong amount of glue. You don't wanna to use too much. You don't wanna use too little, but in general, I think it's um, harder to get a small amount of glue. A lot of times the patient ends up with way too much glue. So I show you here one method of doing the glue. So we put um, the glue on some kind of plastic surface. And then I like using this scleral buckle sponge because you can cut the tip of the scleral buckle sponge to whatever size and shape that you want. Or if you just want the circular shape that it's in, that's nice too. You just dip it into the liquid glue, dab it somewhere else to get a little bit of the excess off and just touch the surface of the cornea very briefly and you get a nice round dab of glue. Um, if there is a deep ulceration and you want to fill that Delin shape, uh, another method to do is to use a needle. I actually use a large gauge needle and allow the glue to drip off the end of the needle right into the Delin. Of course, the patient would have to be laying down when you do this. Or to use the bevel of the needle, the large bore needle, and dab that into the glue so you have glue like this. And if that shape is nicely fits into the ulceration, you can just dab that and get a nice um, application of glue in just the area you need. And we always put a contact lens on top to protect it. Um, so in this situation, um, you would still continue the antimicrobial therapy. The contact lens is unfortunate that you need it because um, you want the best penetration of the antimicrobial therapy, the topical drops as you can. Um, and the idea is that you're temporizing the situation so that the perforation can heal while you continue to treat medically. But my pearl number 10 is to know when you should proceed to penetrating keratoplasty. But there's a difference between uh, tectonic and therapeutic penetrating keratoplasty and optical penetrating keratoplasty. So, you know, here's an example of a patient who you can see has a very large uh, decimetaseal is near perforation. This is not appropriate for glue, uh, just like the patient I showed earlier with the vitreous coming to the eyelashes. Um, this is not appropriate for um, glue. You definitely need um, to take this patient to penetrating keratoplasty. In this case, it was a case of herpetic keratitis. It was a known case of herpetic keratitis that the patient had stopped using their uh, oral acyclovir and said that, oh, I washed my face this morning and then I felt a gush of fluid and came in looking like this. Um, but not just for perforations. Here is a case that we are taking care of uh, recently, the residents showed me this photograph on the left. So this is a patient who had a pseudomonas corneal ulcer at the six o'clock position. The patient was even admitted to the hospital and unfortunately he has COVID. So he's in the COVID ward and he cannot leave the COVID ward to come to the slit lamp. So the, this photograph on the left and the upper right are taken um, by the residents with their, with their cell phone. So they have this patient in the hospital for weeks and telling me that the pseudomonas ulcer is not getting better and they're putting fortifieds. Um, and their reasoning for thinking that the ulcer is not getting better is because the epithelial defect is not closing. And so I finally went to see this patient with them uh, in the hospital the other day. And what I saw is that I think that this six o'clock corneal infiltrate is actually just a scar with an overlying large epithelial defect. But what really concerned me is the extension past the six o'clock limbus. So, and then the, you can see the B scan is starting to show vitreous opacities. So what happened here is that 
the pseudomonas crossed the limbal border and extended into the sclera. And this patient got infectious scleritis that progressed from infectious keratitis. If we had done a penetrating keratoplasty before it crossed the limbal barrier, the patient would have done much better. So we took this patient to the operating room, opened the inferior conjunctiva to find a limbal scleral perforation with uh, uvea protruding under it. And the uh, entire inferior um, anterior sclera was necrotic. And we think that it also progressed to endophthalmitis because there was an unknown um, uh, perforation. So you don't want this to happen. You don't want this to progress from a corneal ulcer to all of this. So if you see it approaching the limbus, that's when I would do a penetrating keratoplasty. Here's another case. Uh, we had um, a series recently of three cases of fungal keratitis with an interesting organism called Paciomyces. And so we, we took all three patients to penetrating keratoplasty because they were not doing better. And you can see on histopathology that the organism extends all the way to decimates membrane. One of our fellows did one of these cases um, and showed me at this point that look, after his penetrating keratoplasty, the patient had recurrent infection. And when I reviewed the chart, I think that the mistake that was made was he made an assumption that when he removed this infected cornea, that he got all the organisms. So when he did the penetrating keratoplasty, he continued the antifungal, but he added topical steroid as if it was a routine penetrating keratoplasty for a non-infectious case. So I think four times a day, topical steroid. And within two weeks, a patient came back looking like this. So we had to repeat all of these um, cases. We had to repeat graft all of them and using no topical steroid. So of course, without using topical steroid, the graft is going to fail. But I care less about the graft failure in this situation. I care much more that the fungal keratitis does not recur. Because I know if the, if the graft fails, I can always do a graft another optical graft later when the cornea is sterilized. And that is my plan for these patients. So to conclude, I just want to share with you briefly, like a, in my mind, what is my organism for treating corneal ulcers? If it's a very small, typical looking ulcer, I start just a single antibiotic with high frequency, something that the patient can get commercially like moxifloxacin. If it is greater than two millimeters or has atypical features, I always scrape it. Our rule is two millimeters, but if it's smaller than two millimeters, but there's something strange about it, I would still scrape it. For any severe bacterial ulcers or suspected bacterial ulcers, we use two fortified antibiotics. Our preference is to use fortified vancomycin, 25 milligrams per milliliter, and topical tubermycin at 14 milligrams per milliliter. We are fortunate that um, there is a nearby pharmacy that can supply these to the patients. And then we'll also add moxifloxacin or sometimes polytrim to that regimen as well. And my typical regimen, if it's very severe, is I give a loading dose of one drop of each antibiotic every 15 minutes for the first hour, every 30 minutes for the second hour, every hour for the rest of that day, and then every two hours, including overnight for the first 24 hours, and then see the patient again, and then adjust accordingly. And then I consider starting the corticosteroids in bacterial ulcers only after I'm sure it's a bacterial ulcer and that they have shown to improve on the antibiotics. This is according to the SCUT trial. But if there's any atypical features or the patient is not responding to antibiotics and I don't have a culture to guide me, then I consider either a corneal biopsy or you know, another culture where I pass a suture through or confocal microscopy. I realize you don't have confocal microscopy and I have the luxury of having the confocal in my office. So I actually um, do the confocal very early, but I realize that most people cannot do that. So I put it here as you know, su suggesting you to consider the confocal microscopy when something is not going as according to plan. If we suspect fungal keratitis or we have evidence of um, 
fungal keratitis, such as uh, fusarium or aspergillosis, then we start natamycin. This is according to the MUT trial that we always use natamycin as first line. I think if you want to use natamycin plus voriconazole, that's okay. But according to the MUT trial, you should not use voriconazole without natamycin. And if we suspect yeast, then I use amphotericin. If we suspect acanthamoeba in our practice, we use two topical agents. Um, some people use three, some people use one. I don't think there's evidence-based uh, data to support exactly how many agents you should use. And then for herpetic keratitis, we talked about for stromal keratitis using oral antivirals plus a topical corticosteroid, uh, although you should be careful about using topical corticosteroids in epithelial herpetic disease. If the cornea is perforated, the globe must be closed, either with glue or a patch graft or a penetrating keratoplasty, depending on the size and the situation. And I perform a therapeutic PKP if the infectious keratitis is not resolving, or especially if it's getting worse, and certainly if there's any risk for progression to endophthalmitis or scleritis. But if it is possible, I prefer to treat medically and wait until the cornea is completely sterilized and the epithelium healed before proceeding to an optical penetrating keratoplasty so that I feel safe using the normal amount of topical steroid that I would normally use after a non-infectious case. So that concludes um, my presentation for this uh, for for today, but I'm, I'm happy to take any questions. And if we don't get to the questions, I also put my email here if you would like to contact me. Thank you, Dr. Lee, for such a comprehensive presentation. I would like to mention that our experience is pretty much similar to the one, the approaches and medical treatment. We also do not use steroids for fungal, um, for fungal, uh, the PKPs that are done for fungal infection. Mm -hmm. And also I'm not using personally, if, PKP was done for acanthamoeba as well. Uh, I'm kind of scared for acanthamoeba too, because uh, especially for acanthamoeba in Armenia, it's, a, it's very difficult. We have only chlorhexidine drops available here. Mm -hmm. So whenever we suspect acanthamoeba, we quickly go for PKP to save the eye before it mm -hmm. gets into sclera. And here, the only way to diagnose acanthamoeba is that we send a specimen to the lab saying, put it on non nutrition agar with E. coli. That's the only way to diagnose here and also the history of well, uh, tap water, contact lines, mm -hmm. etc. So it's pretty much similar everything what you are telling. And I would say that the case that my resident showed before with Mycobacterium chelone was a case that we were able to diagnose with um, patch, you know, with a patch. Uh, uh, corneal biopsy. It's a trephination, corneal trephination that mm -hmm. I use the three millimeter tree fine that is included in Boston type 1 keratoprosthesis oh. package. So I keep it just for that <laughs> purposes because we were sure we were dealing with infection, but the lab was saying, you know what, there is no infection. And after the third attempt, mm -hmm. after biopsy, 70%, the lab then said that it's mycobacterium. Yeah, that's pretty much similar what we are facing here. Thank you for just summarizing all this, very important. And regarding the glue, um, the one I had from me back from US was a cyanoacrylate, but it contained kind of plastic pipettes that was easy yes. to squeeze and put it, uh, that was that we were using for a long time. Uh, so you mean so, that you get, so are you saying that you get both the dermatologic punch and the uh, the cyanoacrylate glue all the way from the United States? You You don't have any way to, get more? <laughs> um, well, as far as I have that Boston K pros, you know, with me and I keep that, it's very useful. I do not need to find it here. Regarding cyanoacrylate, uh, honestly, it was a present from Roger Ohanisian, <laughs> our <laughs> ACP director. And it was a huge, you know, it, it lasted like many years, I remember, but I, I still <laughs> need to look for it again, because it was easy just to put a small amount, contact lens and you are kind of safe. Now, when we don't have glue, we use this amniotic membrane to cover. Mm. It's very cheap here in Armenia, easy. Mm. Uh, so pretty much the same everything. Thank you so much. <laughs> yeah, I didn't go too much into acanthamoeba because I feel like that is a Rare. complicated, yeah, a complicated disease. And I I used to be like you, not, not think about using topical steroid at yes. all. Um, yes. But I'm right. starting to feel a little bit differently because Again, I have the 
benefit of having a comfortable microscope. So I can, I follow the patients while they're being treated. So right. I can see what is happening to the cyst. So I can see that the cyst density is decreasing and I can see the inflammatory cells. So I am now starting to feel like there is a right time to add it, to add the steroid, but carefully. And I'm still learning about when is the exact right time and how much, et cetera. And then about the penetrating keratoplasty, Matt and I have talked about this. Um, I think your theory makes a lot of sense of doing the penetrating keratoplasty to get rid of the organism. I will tell you, I've had more than one case where because, again, because I have the benefit of the confocal microscope, I like to image different areas on the cornea. So let's say the cornea is this large and you see the ring ulcer here. You would assume clinically that this is where the infection is, but I can do the confocal here, 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 here. I can tell you there's cysts all the way to the limbus. Be careful because when you do your trephination, you're going to leave some cysts there. And what happens is those cysts then go yes. into the new graft. Right, correct. Right. Whenever we get a confocal microscope, we will kindly invite you to teach us how to use it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Yeah. And maybe we go to the third presentation. Uh, Mariam Razaria, second year resident. She will present herpetic stromal necrotizing keratitis. Mariam, would you please go? Hello, dear colleagues, dear guests. I would like to thank Armenian Eye Care Project for the given opportunity. And it's a big honor for me to be one of the first presenters in this initiative, the ACP Run Rounds. I would like to talk about herpetic stromal necrotizing keratitis and um, show you our treatment approaches and then discuss the, your uh, treatment approaches with um, our viewers. Uh, so just a quick reminder about the uh, herpes virus family and here are the organisms which are in fact only humans. So herpes simplex virus, varicella zoster virus, Epstein-Barr virus, cytomegalovirus, and human herpes virus 6 and 7 and also 8 which is also known as Kaposi sarcoma virus. Uh, the first three are uh, the ones which usually affect the eye. And the first one is the, the herpes simplex virus is the one which is the main cause of corneal blindness uh, worldwide. The seroprevalence of herpes simplex virus is 90% and primary infection affects 1% to 6% of the people who are carrying the infection. Uh, what about our statistics? It's uh, in, in our cornea uveitis department from 2010 to 2022, we had more than 1,000 documented herpetic eye disease cases, and approximately 7% of them were herpetic stromal necrotizing keratitis. Uh, this is the classification according to Manis and Ed Holland. And the first one is uh, infectious epithelial keratitis, the second one, neurotrophic keratopathy, stromal keratitis, which has two subtypes necrotizing stromal keratitis and immune stromal keratitis, and endotelitis. Uh, now we're going to talk about necrotizing stromal keratitis. Uh, herpetic stromal necrotizing keratitis is a rare manifestation of herpes simplex virus, and it's thought to be a result from direct viral invasion of the corneal stroma. The clinical findings include necrosis, ulceration, dense infiltration of the stroma, and also an overlying epithelial defect. What is more important here, we hear, here we have replicating virus and severe host inflammatory response that leads to destructive intrastromal inflammation that is often refractory to treatment with high dosage anti-inflammatory and antiviral medications. Symptoms include pain, redness, photophobia, blurred vision, and tearing. Um, although these kind of cases are very um, hard to treat, not hard, but very uh, challenging to treat, because uh, as I already mentioned here, we have both active virus and immune response. There are no um, certain uh, accepted protocols for the treatment. Here is uh, just a slide from the recent publications showing the methods of uh, possible treatment. And here is our regimen. 
And in our cases, we initiate the treatment with topical gonciclovir five times a day when tapering it in three weeks, topical cycloplegics, systemic acyclovir or balacyclovir, depending uh, if the patient can afford uh, the more expensive one or not. And uh, we also consider taking oral doxycycline if uh, there was stromal lysis present, and especially if it's more than uh, 30 to 40 percent. And usually after um, seven to 10 days when uh, it's not that risky, we're going to bethamethasone subtenant injections and repeating it after a week with uh, higher doses. After total epithelization, we're adding mild steroids two, three times a day, along with oral antiviral coverage, of course. And uh, for uh, scar formation, we're, and as an antioxidant, we're giving vitamin C um, to our patients as well. If there was a perfor uh, perforation, and as uh, we already talked about the glue, uh, if we had glue, we would use it, but uh, we're mostly using amniotic membrane. And in unresponsive cases, um, if it's, um, there is a risk for perforation, we are going to PK surgery. For example, in this case, we uh, had multiple recurrences on the graft, and here we also can see um, in the center the uh, strong the thinning and um, so this was a refractory patient and we had to go to pk and uh, now going to our cases i would like to talk about two cases which uh, the treatment for which was controversial and uh, we were almost at the same time in our department so we treated them like simultaneously, but a little differently. The first case, when uh, the first case was treated without uh, bethamethasone subtin injections, and the second case uh, necessitated it. And uh, not going into details, I just would like to say that um, the first patient was a 65 year old male. He his visual acuity of the left eye was light perception, intraocular pressure was normal by palpation, and slit lamp exam revealed. Uh, limbal injection, uh, corneal uh, edema, then stromal infiltrate, hypopion, uh, and epithelial overlying epithelial defect. And um, we did scraping, cultures, and PCR, and empirically prescribed moxifloxacin, uh, fluconazole, doxycycline, psychoplegics, and artificial uh, tears. Um, three days later, uh, the results came, but the patient uh, was uh, PCR positive for HSV1 and HSV2, and the diagnosis was uh, put hepatic stromal necrotizing keratitis. We added val uh, valacyclovir and gonciclovir and kept the other uh, medications as before. Here we can see the epithelial defect and the hypopion. Uh, four days later, uh, which was one week after the, the first presentation of the, per, uh, of the patient, we uh, saw him again. Here we can see that the epithelial defect got smaller, but still the, uh, the hypopion is present, so we continued the treatment. This is 20 days after the first presentation. Um, uh, the medications were almost the same, and we can see that uh, the hypopion is a lot less in this picture. And one month post initial presentation, the patient was cytal negative and the treatment was the same, but we added fluoromethylene eye drops twice a day. We can see that um, we almost don't have hypopion here and uh, it's better looking the eye. Uh, two months post initial presentation, so these pictures were uh, taken yesterday, um, we can see that we don't have any hypopion here, we just have anterior strom stromal scar. In the second picture, we can see that we have a formed anterior chamber, and on the third picture, no epithelial defects. The visual acuity was, of course, better, it was 2500, and um, we're still uh, hoping to have more improvements for this patient. For the next case, uh, we had 74-year-old female, uh, again, with light perception, right light perception, intraocular pressure was normal. Uh, we had, um, again, 
Uh, it was strong pressure was not normal. It was it, 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 it was uh, minus, sorry. And uh, here we had perforation. We had uh, a stromal infiltrate. We had epithelial defect, of course. We had perforation. I already mentioned, and uh, a little injection. This patient was unable to pay for any kind of um, test like PCR scraping or anything. So we empirically added both um, antiviral medications uh, and uh, with uh, antibacterial coverage, we can see here with tobamycin, erythromycin, and also with uh, we uh, prescribed psychoplegics, toxicycline, and the next day we did amniotic membrane transplantation. It was with contact lens? Yes, uh, this patient already presented okay. with contact lens wearing a contact lens with a referral doctor. And um, after the tra transplantation of the amniotic membrane, we saw her uh, nine days later, the membrane was resolved and the suture was removed. Uh, anterior chamber was formed, but the eye we can see here is more inflamed. We can see hypopian, scleritis, the infiltrate is enlarged and the surrounding corneal, uh, the surrounding cornea is edematous. The, uh, the treatment was continued the same, but we increased the tobermycin dosage to um, uh, every two hours and erythromycin twice a day. Also for the uh, scleritis, we added oral ibuprofen 40 milligrams. Uh, and the patient was advised to see us in four to five days, but presented a lot later, like 12 days. And uh, we see that the clinical appearance is about the same. And we knew it was risky, but the dexamethasone subtinin injections. And the next day she presented with almost resolved hypopian. And we were very happy. So decided to do dexamethasone subtinin injection, 0.3 milliliters. And uh, five days later, she was still on the same treatments and we can see how calm the eye is. This um, thing on the eyelashes, it's just the, uh, the erythromycin ointment, ointment. It's not um, an infection or something. So um, we discontinued the tobromycin. And uh, yesterday, five weeks post initial presentation, we saw her again and uh, we had quite eye, anterior stromal scar, formed anterior chamber, and in the first photo, we can see uh, no staining. This is just pulling. And we added vitamin C uh, for, um, for handling the scar. These are the follow-up pictures put side to side, so it will be easier to compare. So the first patient uh, was without bethamethasone subtinin injection, eight weeks post uh, initiating the treatment. And the second patient, uh, second row is the patient with bethamethasone subtinin injections, five weeks post uh, initiating the treatment. We can see that the clinical outcome and um, appearance is quite similar, but we managed them uh, differently. differently. And we have uh, two questions for our colleagues. Uh, the first one is, what is your approach in such cases, steroids or no steroids five to seven days later after initiate, initial presentation? And do prescribe antibiotic drops as well for prophylactic reasons in cases associated with huge epithelial defects like five millimeters or higher. Thank you. Your second question is much easier to answer. Your, your, the answer to your second question is yes. Uh, we always, if there is an epithelial defect, even if it is not a bacterial um, case, we always, or anything, we always use uh, prophylactic and topical antibiotic. Um, the, your first question is more complicated. Um, I'm very impressed with your result and I had not thought of using a subtenance injection. Maybe I will think of it in next time <laughs> because of <laughs> we're using it already twenty years. <laughs> yeah, that's that's a interesting idea. Um, I mean, I was taught to not even use a subtenons catalog injection for scleritis, but over the years I have adopted that too for non necrotizing scleritis. I, I okay. will use subtenons catalog injection, if for some reason, I prefer to try that over oral steroid. Um, so I don't, so I, I do have some experience doing that, but only for non 
necrotizing anterior scleritis. So I hadn't thought of it for necrotizing keratitis. This is an interesting idea. Um, so my question to you is, why not try oral prednisone first? That, can I go with this? This my this this is more my experience that my resident was presenting because these patients were over 65, 74 year old, and oral prednisone carries too many risks. You know, aseptic mm -hmm. necrosis, diabetes, hypertension, etc. So we always use this subtenone. It's easy here in Armenia. I remember during my fellowship at UCSF Proctor Foundation. <laughs> the patient needed to sign papers for subtenone injections, etc. Here, it's much easier to say the patient, you need an injection, mm -hmm. and they never worry about it, and we too. And, you know, if you do dexamethasone, and you can see the patient next day, that you know that in 24 hours, this dexamethasone is gone. If you're mistaken, so it's just one day mistake. And then mm -hmm. you go with subtenone, bethamethasone, knowing that it will last maximum 14 days. So this makes things easier. I see. And okay. They can come and see you next day. This is what makes easy here. That's true. I was thinking we usually use trimcinolone, so it lasts much longer. Okay. Yeah. I we think use trimcinolone for patients that are from far uh, regions, like visiting from Artsakh, from you know very far places. So we go with trimcinolone, of course. Mm -hmm. But those that can come and see you in a week, in five days, two days later, bethamethasone is much stronger. You get better, you know, and faster yeah. improvement. Mm -hmm. Interesting. I will, I, I think <laughs> I will think about doing that next time. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Wade, anything to add? No, I think this is great. I really, I just want to give my appreciation to Dr. Gregorian, Dr. Lee, Dr. Huang, Dr. Gazarian, of course, to you, Anna Hobokimian, and to Nune Gazarian. I think this has been uh, this has been really neat. Any other questions you guys have that you want to voice? In particular around herpetic disease, since you see so much, is there anything else you you kind of would like some feedback on or that anything else you could teach us, just like you've taught us about that? Yeah. Come on, thank you so much. Not teaching, but uh... <laughs> Uh, we use oral doxycycline in cases when there is more than 40% thinning just to do MMP inhibition, you know, uh, just for that purposes. And I think it really helps. And we do not use moxifloxacin that can activate MMPs. We usually go with tobramycin. Whenever chloramphenicol is available, we go with that. Unfortunately, it's hard to find here. So we usually use tobramycin, even knowing it's toxic to epithelium. But if you use it for a shorter period, you do not see that toxicity much, right? So um, that's what I can say. Can I, let me double click on that because I know when we were, I was out there, a few of us were talking about that activation of MMP9 that you referenced regarding the uh, the moxifloxacin. And Olivia, what do you have any thoughts about I, that's not I did something not that? that. I, I knew that until you just said that. <laughs> yeah, I, me neither. I mean, we we use moxy for pretty much everything at all times and in all places. So I I'm curious as to if that's something that's Maybe a lot more clinically significant than I'm understanding, or or is it, uh, or is it not as clinically significant? I don't I don't know. Uh, last time we had a case that you, Sarkis, and Doctor and John saw, and you know I think it was Sarkis's idea to yeah, give Moxie, sorry. and I kept the photo. He presented four days later with melt and perf. I would say maybe in Armenian eyes we have too many MMPs. I don't know. It activates it a lot. <laughs> that's yeah. funny, but maybe that's Armenian factor. I don't know. Well, we have a um, a point of service test for MMP nine. Um, maybe we should use it to think uh, with this in mind. We um, it's commercially available. Maybe you don't have it. It's called Inflamadry, and mm -hmm. um, you just touch the lower lid gather a little bit of the patient's tears and within 10 minutes you get a result. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We had it yeah, one we could about send a few over there. We can compare MMP9 levels between the <laughs> US and Armenian eyes if you feel like they're different. And it's going to be great research. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Do you have um, access to Center German? To send Center German, the recombinant human nerve growth factor. Here in Armenia, like Oxervate, you mean? Yes, Oxervate. 
Oh no, I know it's seven thousand dollars in US. No, no, it's fifty thousand dollars. <laughs> fifty. <laughs> Sorry, but we do use a lot of serum tears so that really oh. works, to my opinion. We use it every two hours in all neurotrophic cases, and if it's not healing, we just go for terzorop. It always helps. Always heals. Mm -hmm. Really cheap here, and it's cheap here, right? <laughs> really cheap. Yeah, even the serum tears are not not cheap here. <laughs> I know. I'm not even remember it is expensive in your country. It's here is yes. really yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, team, I think this has been great. Any any feedback? Anything that you want to do more of or less of in terms of the structure of this for the next go around? I know we're gonna have a different topic next time, but next uh, next well, the cornea next will be maybe in April, right? Right. Yeah. Because we're having neuroophthalmology, glaucoma, retina. So we'll we'll talk about our very fascinating Boston Caper cases. <laughs> okay. Sounds great. I just want to thank everybody. And I don't know if, uh, Anne, if you want to say any closing words. This was really fascinating. And I think all of us learn. And because this exchange of experience in every country, things uh, you know, uh, show a little bit different, but overall our approaches are the same. And that makes us feel happy that we are not uh, kind of different from you. <laughs> it makes us really feel comfortable and more confident. And Dr. Lee's, you know, approaches, keys were really very, very impressive, but it was a comprehensive talk. And I think our resident did very well. I would like to thank everyone for participation and for presentations and hopefully see you soon in april for cornea session thanks everyone sounds thank great you. thank you shot love thank you, love. <laughs> thank you so much thank you thank you and bye bye have a great day yeah